This is Urban Agriculture, episode number 27, The Next Big Things. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about the Third Green Revolution. Joining me today, who else would join me? Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. I'm just stunned. I'm at a loss for words. Yeah, me too. But I'm no, no. I'm never at a loss for words, and I've never known you to be at a loss for words either. So, I Vincent, stay with respect to this podcast. <clears throat> well, let's begin this podcast on a positive note. Let me ask you, <laughs> what what day is today? Halloween. And what is Halloween? Oh, they sequenced the pumpkin genome. Really? <laughs> Did you know that was cool. released in time for Halloween? <laughs> That's cool. I like that. What so, is set? Well, is celebrated at, Hall- at yeah. Halloween? Oh. Goblins, ghosts, it's in traditional zombies. Words. Yeah, that's today. <clears throat> but in the old days, Halloween was yeah, no. a different kind of day. What was it? What it was to celebrate the harvest. Is that right? That's correct. So we're celebrating the harvest. Are we celebrating the vertical harvest? We're going to celebrate <laughs> the production of food. How's that? And today is an appropriate day to have this podcast come back on air because. Uh, indeed, there has been a rebirth of this. Or I, I wouldn't say a rebirth of the idea because the idea has always been there, but there has certainly been a rebirth of the, um, the, the, I guess the uh, ex- explanation as to where this field has gone since the last podcast, and that's that's why we're on the air tonight. Do you remember what the last <laughs> urban ag was? <laughs> this is a quiz. You know, you shouldn't ask somebody my age that Oh, I question. know it, though. It was a year ago, almost, to this month. <laughs> almost a year. And it was Gene Giacomelli. No, yeah. no, not Gene. No, no. It was the other fella. Yeah, that's right, the other fella. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember his name? He was a CEO also. You're not recording this, I hope. It was Robert Colangelo. Oh, yes. No, what's the name of his organization? He's in know? Michigan. Oh, no, he's in Portage, Indiana, and his... Portage, that's where I'm going this week. <laughs> You're going to Indiana. That's right. Exactly right. Hopefully with no, not with a banjo on your knee. Um, the name of his organization is... Green Sense Farms. Green Sense Farms. That's exactly right. And he has Green Sense Radio. He does a podcast. Also. Yeah, no, I've actually been on his show. So that's I think that's how we got him because I was already on his show. And, and Green uh, Sense Farms is located... Portage. Portage, Indiana? Correct. And he's doing very well, by the way. Uh, Green Sense Farms has now got a presence in China. So we could bring that up to date, too. That is to say, since this last podcast, was your, which was about a year ago, that's true. So much has happened over a year's period that we not only felt um, obliged to come back on with another podcast about updates, but also to to make some predictions about what's going to happen. All right. So what's been going on? So let's... Take it back uh, to last summer, and uh, I can I can tell you my personal experience of being invited to two meetings. One was called a green tech meeting, and if you uh, we are online as we speak, so we can type out green tech and find out what that's all about. <coughs> green tech is a a trade show that's held in various places throughout the world, and the last time. Um, it was held that I could attend because I was invited to give a talk was in uh, Amsterdam and uh, at their convention centers. And they have a huge amount of space at their convention centers. And um, that's the thing that surprised me the most about just attending one of these trade shows is to find out how many manufacturers there are now that manufacture specifically for the indoor plant and growing industry. Specifically for edible plants, which is remarkable, and I I couldn't actually generate time enough to visit all of the uh, the booths because they were spread out over such a large area. It was quite amazing, actually. And then I was invited to another meeting called Seeds and Chips, which is an annual meeting too. It's got a kind of a cute name to it. Seeds, you could understand the chips. I'm not too sure about what that means. Uh, so uh, hire a crisper, and they'll come in and help you out. <laughs> Seeds and chips. Seeds and chips. I couldn't find a green whatever. Green you tech. Couldn't green find tech. that. Green. But I found green seeds and chips. Seeds and chips had a meeting in Milan. And, and Obama's there. I was at that meeting. 
He talked extemporaneously for three hours about his experiences in the White House. And guess who he was interviewed by? Who? His chief of staff for food production, <laughs> or otherwise known as his chief chef. <laughs> so his chef, his personal chef in the White House, became good friends with Obama, obviously, mm -hmm. because of many, many reasons, of course, uh, and got really close to him in terms of his personal. So you heard Obama speak. I was at that meeting was with my good? wife. It was fabulous. It was just absolutely fabulous. And to hear him discuss the future, in his view, the future of food and of agriculture in general, and how indoor farming has um, become a presence in the agricultural scene mm -hmm. uh, was very encouraging for all those people in the audience that had connections to the indoor growing industries. And there were many, many, many people at that meeting who were part of that scene. Uh, I must say that, that uh, this was not our only stop on our trip. We actually flew from Milan down to South Africa where um, there was another meeting being held in Peter Maritzburg, which is uh, one of the towns uh, next to Johannesburg in uh, South Africa. And their university uh, wants to establish an indoor growing system for training people to grow their food indoors rather than having to put up with all the weather conditions of outdoors. And, and animals, too, by the way. In Africa, of course, they've got a few different problems than we don't have, like invasion from animals like elephants. <laughs> you grow a crop like corn, and the next thing you know, you come the next morning and it's all gone, and you see these big round footprints all over the place. And <laughs> Where did they go? Where did they go? I must tell you an anecdote about this. My wife and I took a, a trip to the game parks, of course, where I go there unless you can do that too. And uh, as we were being driven through one of these game parks, uh, the driver says, oh, I can see the elephants and, and way down the road on the road itself were about maybe 12 elephants. And as we drove closer, of course, the elephants began to realize that we were there and they began to part to make room for the car to go through. Now, if I was an elephant, I don't think I would care too much. <laughs> I just stand there and say, Oh yeah, you want to come through here? Just try. You know, But that's, that's just me talking here. <laughs> the elephants, Vincent disappeared into the brush without a noise. We could not hear them walk. Mm. We couldn't hear a stick break. We couldn't hear a, a, a bush rub up against their trunks or their legs. They were as quiet and as stealthy as you can possibly imagine. And for, just, for such a large animal, it's actually incredible. So mm. when you think about the problems of growing food outdoors in South Africa, that's one of their problems. And so they have to solve that in some way. And they thought, well, you know, indoor farming might be a solution to this mm -hmm. for some situations, not for everything, but for some situations, indoor farming might offer us a solution that we could um, build on and get started. And and they were quite amazed to find out how advanced the technologies were at that point, because so, that was my job is to sort of inform them as to what was going on. So I felt privileged to be at both of these meetings, actually three of them. The Green Tech meeting was one, but Seeds and Chips for sure. And then this meeting at Peter Maritzburg. So that's that's actually not why we're having this. Uh, Peter Maritzburg. Peter Maritzburg. <clears throat> What's the name of that meeting? It wasn't the name. The name of the meeting was being sponsored by the University of. Okay, I can't find it online. No, no, you wouldn't find it. You okay, it wasn't uh, one of those things that were there. At any rate, so so what has happened since last year? And uh, I know that last year we also uh, interviewed uh, the owners and the grower for Aero Farms. Uh, that's one of our episodes. Mm -hmm. right? And we were actually in their facility doing the interviewing. So we got a chance to look around, a chance to uh, see what they were planning, but they hadn't completed their plans when we had finished that interview and uh, had them on as guests. And so I think what we need to do is go back and revisit them because what's happened in the meantime is very exciting from their perspective. And so vertical, uh, the vertical farm, Aero Farms, has opened in the Ironbound District of Newark. It's a 70,000 square foot facility. It's been completely remodeled to accommodate indoor growing systems in these large racks of aeroponically grown microgreens. And they had so much um, capital in reserve that they are now opening two more versions of themselves. And one of them is in, in Camden, New Jersey. So the, this is interesting because their initial investment from Goldman Sachs, the city of Newark, and Prudential Life Insurance uh, totaled some $40 million. Now, to some people, that sounds like a lot of money, and to other people, it sounds like chump change. To 
a, a startup grow farmers that had to remodel an entire building, mm-hmm. hire personnel, get everything straightened out in terms of their legal uh, uh, contracts with uh, with with people who supply building materials, with people who handle personal uh, or personnel uh, resources for sure. Uh, this and and lots of legalese uh, stuff going on, so they had a lot of expenses. And to still have money left in order to establish two more facilities, that's a remarkable management of of their finances. And so they have been all over the map in terms of publicity and people have accepted their produce and have just actually flocked to the restaurants that feature those uh, produces for, let's say, salads and to make other dishes in which the microgreens are are essential. Uh Everyone remarks as to how fresh things taste and how different those vegetables taste when they're just freshly picked versus when they're sitting around for a while. That's even a day or two days or three days. So recently, uh, to bring that up to date, Ed Harwood, who is the person uh, responsible for the patented process of actually growing those crops aeroponically, he uh, is the partner along with Mark Oshima and uh, David Rosenberg. He was on our uh, our yes. episode, right? That's right. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly right. Uh, so Ed Harwood and I shared the stage at a meeting sponsored by the Wall Street Journal, which was about two weeks ago now in New York City at the uh, Park Hyatt uh, Hotel. And we were interviewed by one of the reporters from the Wall Street Journal. And we can put that on this uh, on the show notes because that's uh, online and available. And uh, the whole day's... Um, symposium that was sponsored by the Wall Street Journal was all about how technology is disrupting the food system and how it's changing things and how interesting life has become now that there are other choices besides waiting for the seasonal greens to come in or to the to the corn crop or to perhaps even to uh, some staple crops like wheat and rice and corn. All those uh, topics were under discussion um, a week and a half ago over at uh, this hotel. And I was quite amazed to see some familiar faces emerging out of the darkness, let's say, of <laughs> what happened to that guy. You know, <laughs> So I ran into the former uh, Secretary of Agriculture for the state of California. <laughs> and, and trust me, everybody out there, we're, we're trying desperately to get this guy to say yes again. He did say yes to me while I was at the meeting, so I'm not going to mention his name right now. But um, we're, our hope is that we can get him as a guest on our show, too, so that we can find out what actually happens to a former Secretary of Agriculture from a large agriculture state like California where the gross national product for that state is something in the neighborhood of $65 million. Bill, I'm sorry, did I say million? Mm. I meant billion. $65 billion worth of agricultural product is produced by the state of California, half of which is dairy farm. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> How did I learn that? I learned that by going to a meeting that he was chairing some time ago, where indeed I first met Gene Giacomelli. So some of these names – should be household words now to our listeners who have come back online and says, oh, thank God there's another urban egg being recorded. <clears throat> so there's a, a thread that runs through all of this, and that is that all of the people that started with passion for growing food indoors have not gone away. And in fact, here's what's happened in the meantime. So I have an article in the World Street Journal from May yeah. 2017 okay. it's called A Farm Grows in the City. Look at that. Startups are leading the way to a future in which more food is grown closer to where people live. And guess who they speak with here? So first of all, uh, they speak with urban produce. Good. Um, Where is that? That's Irvine. Urban produce is Irvine. Then they've been on our show. They've been on our show. They have. Uh, They also speak with, uh, they don't speak with the Newark folks. Henry Gordon Smith. Right. He's been on our show. Director of Blue Planet Consulting, a company that specializes in the design, implementation, and operation of urban agricultural products. Exactly. He's been on the show. Yep. And they also talk with Paul Hardy. Ah, good old Paul. (laughs) So Paul, it says here, has uh, developed Civic Farms. He's now co-founder and chief of Civic Farms, a company that develops a 2.0 version of the vertical farm, more efficient operations. Yeah. That take into account the lessons learned from farmed here. 
Yeah. He and his wife ran farmed here, and apparently it was not located um, in a place which would allow them to actually show profitability. It was in Bedford Park, Illinois, rather than in mm-hmm. Chicago. So that 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 vertical farm actually closed, and that's one of the few that haven't made it uh, from the last time we talked to this time. Yeah. There are very few that have actually closed, though, and there are many, many more that have opened. So that's that's why we're talking right now. And he's collaborating with the University of Arizona. Right. Who would that be? Let's think about this, because I have some big news for our listeners with regards to the University of Arizona and some uh, interesting new developments there, too, that as the show. Gene Giacomelli. Gene Giacomelli and staff, because he's got a big outfit right now and uh, lots of interested people out there. And what are you doing? Oh, well, I'm just answering my email. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, don't, I don't have to do anything anymore. You're an advocate, aren't you? I am an advocate. An I'm evangelist. A, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan. I, I don't mean you're to an make evangelist. this. Now, if you say that, that has religious overtones, and I don't like that at all. I don't like There used that. to be a guy who worked at Apple. Yeah. He was called the Apple Evangelist. I guess that you was could be the, yeah. Steve Jobs. But, uh, <laughs> no, I'm not like that. I'm not like that. And But, I, you know, I'd call it like it is. I, I try very hard to give a balanced view of this. But the, the view that I'm, I'm expressing right now is positive. And the positive view is that there has been very little negativity and a lot of positivity over the last year. Mm-hmm. So let's continue our discussion of that as a theme then. Uh, so Air Farms is off and running and they're doing well and – and they expect to survive well into the next millennium if, if they have their way about it. Two of the three people who run the company have de- a business degrees from Columbia University, so I think they're at least well-trained. They have a large staff that knows what they're doing, and I think that ensures success because um, they are redundant and resilient. As a result, they, they resemble, in that sense, the, uh, uh, the essence of a balanced ecosystem. Okay. So – then something very interesting happened because before Aerofarms, there was very little fanfare with regards to announcement of investment. Okay. So they wouldn't say, Hey, we just got $20 million. No, no, we just got $30 million. No, we got 60 million. So Aerofarms was the first to actually raise their hands and say, look, a company that invests in the future, Goldman Sachs has thought that our business plan will succeed. And so they invested $15 million in the future of Aero Farms, and they raised the rest from other, other places. So they did raise their hand and say, we just raised $40 million. Then there was this little hiatus of nobody was raising their hand, and then all of a sudden a hand went up in San Francisco from a company that no one had heard of before. And the name of this company is Plenty. Now, before I tell you more about Plenty, let me back up a little bit and preface the story about Plenty with a story about Amazon versus Walmart. Okay, so you've got two big giants out there that are trying to get your dollars. And they're trying all kinds of online uh, feasibility studies to enable and empower and make easier the way you purchase things. Some of them want to use drones to deliver the things to your door. Some of them want to install a lock on your door (laughs) that only they can control, that they can open your front door and leave the package inside so that your neighbors don't come along and steal it from you before you get a chance to come home. That's Amazon. So Jeff Bezos, who runs as a CEO for Amazon, some time ago, maybe six months ago, started to look at the Walmart Walmart model and realized that Walmart was in the food industry as well. Walmart was selling f- fresh produce and selling it like crazy, and people were going to Walmart. It's a one-stop shop. It's not just a one-stop shop for groceries. It's a one-stop shop for a kid's bicycle, flies that you might use in your fishing uh, tire repair kits, uh, you name it, and Walmart sells it. And if you go online, you can see the same thing is true for Amazon. Amazon got into the clothing business and they got into the, you know, computers, all kinds of stuff. And the next thing, you know, the books, they started with books and, and, and now they're even opening real bookstores that you can go in and buy a book at. <laughs> That's a little bit reverse, you know, genetics, as I would put it. <laughs> so what did Jeff Bezos do that thought, would give him an advantage over Walmart's food system. And he thought and thought and thought and thought. And and the idea occurred to me, he says, hey, what's the best food system you know of out there right now that's doing very well? And the answer comes back, 
uh, Whole Foods. So Whole Foods pops up on the radar screen. Amazon says, what would Amazon look like if we bought Whole Foods? Now, how could we use this as a way of moving forward to outcompete what Walmart is doing? Because it now offers an online food supply that you can rely on because Whole Foods, everybody knows Whole Foods, right? I don't know where Walmart gets its food from, what the purveyors of Walmart are, are all about. But, but Amazon certainly took an aggressive move by purchasing 320 stores worth of Whole Foods, and they're spread throughout the country. And if you go online, you can find a map of where they are. And there'll be more, okay? And so we know of a vertical farm. Ah, no, we don't know of a vertical farm. We know of a rooftop farm, which is located on the rooftop of the Whole Foods in the Gowanus Canal area of Brooklyn in New York City. And we know the owner of that. They're called Gotham Greens. And uh, we promise our listeners that very soon we will allow them to listen to their story and to have them tell it. Gotham Greens has become so popular and so successful that they now have a store in Chicago. They started in New York and they got big enough so and successful enough that they have now opened a second uh, front, so to speak, in Chicago. So that's great news. Whether they're on the roof of a Whole Foods or not, I don't know. So in the meantime, back to the Amazon story, because now we've got Jeff Bezos and, you know, I've got this food supplier now. Now, what's the next big thing in food production? And the light bulb goes on. And the next thing you know, he's searching around for a group that can team up with Whole Foods to make food available 24-7. And lo and behold, he finds this group out in San Francisco, Plenty, and decides to invest some of his capital. What is Plenty? Plenty is a company. That does? Its whole uh, mantra <laughs> is to partner with every city in the world, basically, and to insinuate themselves in the middle of every city as vertical farmers. They want to be the next big thing in vertical farming. Okay, and if you read their website uh, description, that's exactly where they're heading. They have models for producing food that they're sort of holding close to their chest, but they want to be the manufacturer of large quantities of food in small spaces. They farm indoors. They do. That's what they say. Yeah, they're going to do more they're, than that. They're using vertical walls of produce. Right. So that's their thing. Is this a real vertical farm? Depends on how high those walls are. Yeah, it's, if it's one story, it's not, right? Exactly. Yeah, probably not. But they're going to I, – I, well, let me just tell you. So they're farmers, right? They are farmers. They're but indoor farmers. They want to be in many different states. They do. All right. So, so get this one now. So then they ran their model past – a Japanese bank, mm -hmm. SoftBank, okay? Now, Japan, as everybody now knows, has the most vertical farms of any country. They've got hundreds of versions of vertical farms spread throughout the Japanese uh, islands, including the main islands, of course. So the imagination now runs wild. <laughs> you know, since I'm, I dream about this stuff, I wake up and I have these moments where I write down stuff and go to the internet to see if that's available or not. And I mm. can imagine in a very short time that the penny will drop, so to speak, as they say, for linking the initiative that P P Plenty has initiated, connecting it with the Whole Foods buildings that are already up to make vertical farms and Whole Foods Synonymous. What do you mean the Whole Foods buildings, the stores? Yeah, because Jeff Bezos also invested in Plenty and now owns the Whole Foods. So do you know who else invested in Plenty? SoftBank. SoftBank. And it is led by a Japanese billionaire. Cool. They lent $200 million to- uh, $200 million. The, the number is $200 million. So That's are, you, are you thinking of putting a- a farm on top of the whole the whole food stores is that what you're thinking? 
If I was Jeff Bezos, that's exactly. It'd be what like I'd a one story, sort of what they did in Brooklyn, right? No, I would. I would think much bigger than that one because that only allows you to grow leafy greens, basically, and and there's more to a grocery store than just leafy greens, right? You're saying one floor is just leafy greens? Yeah. So if you have floor. more than one floor, what can you do? Well, you can grow more than leafy greens. You can you can diversify now. So we're going to get to that because that's my last example. So so plenty. Yes. Do you know any of the people at Plenty? I don't know anybody at Plenty, but I would love to know that company. Because Do they know you? I don't know. They might. <laughs> <laughs> they might. It's possible. But uh, we're going to get to the uh, crescendo part of this uh, symphony of new vertical farming initiatives when I talk to you about the last example that fits into this pattern. But let's finish this one first. What would the food system of America or any other place for that matter look like if every grocery store could grow their own food? Every grocery store. That's a new concept because we've talked about restaurants. We have. And we've talked about hyper-local farms who sell to local stores. That's right. right. But now you're saying the grocery store itself. Exactly right. So imagine your own life. Just put yourself in the future. Say that that's happened. And now say, Vincent, what are you having for dinner tonight? And Vincent says, you know, Dixon, last night we had XX and X, and I think I'll have X, Y, and Y tonight. I said, really? Where are you going to go to shop for all that stuff? He said, ah, we got a vertical farm working just down the street from us. So you go with your shopping list, of course, that you shared with your your Mm. better half, as they would say. And you both agree that this is what you should buy. And you walk in, and they hand you an iPad. And the iPad has a menu. Mm -hmm. And the menu has uh, root vegetables, grains, uh, spices, herbs, fruits. It has a list of stuff that you'd see in a normal grocery store that if you just walked around, you'd see all that, right? Because that's what a grocery store is all about. These are not packaged goods now. These are all fresh produce. That's all we're talking Mm -hmm. about. And your list includes things, and of course, there's the meat department and that sort of thing as, as well. And you're making your list. You've got your list in one hand, you got your iPad in the other hand, and then all of a sudden you start clicking off the things you need and how much you need of it, right? You say, you know, tomatoes, these are which kind of tomatoes? Now, let's see, heirloom tomatoes. I think I'm going to go over and check them out. So you go over there and you walk around this sort of like a, a viewing area as to the kinds of produce that they're producing. And you look inside the viewing area, and there, there is the bin with a few heirloom tomatoes in it, and they've got a little drawer that comes out. And there's a person behind the bin, and you're, you're pointing like you were at a fish market. I, I want that one. No, 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 the one next day. Ah, that's the one I want. So you point to the bin that's got heirloom tomatoes, and the person points down. You, you nod, yes. And they put an heirloom tomato on the table, and they cut it in half. Then they cut it in quarters. And they put a slice of it on a little plate. They put it in the drawer and they shove it out for you. And you take it and you go, you put it in your mouth and you eat it. So yeah, yeah, that's the one I want. Those are the good ones. Mm -hmm. Great. How many do you want? Let's have six of those because we're making salad and kids are coming over with their grandkids. Mm -hmm. By that time, this is what would happen. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Aiden's coming over with his wife and grandkids Mm -hmm. and and you got to get ready for this, right? So this is playing out very well. And the next thing you know, you've made your grocery list. And it says checkout, just like it does online for whether you're finished shopping online, checking out. So where do you go for that? Well, it's the counter over there, okay? So you take your iPad, you walk over to the counter, and your number is 733, and they look at 733 like you go to B&H to buy photographic equipment, right? And you get a number, and there's your bin, and it's all been picked and bagged up for you. What about the steaks? Do they kill the cows upstairs? <laughs> we, we won't be talking about that yet. <laughs> <laughs> you mean the buffalo steaks? Yeah, we can mm-hmm. talk about the buffalo steaks, but let's talk about this first because what you're going to do next is you're going to insert your card with the chip, of course, in there and wait for the thing to say approved, mm-hmm. and they're going to hand you your groceries. You're going to take them home and eat them. Mm-hmm. This is all fresh stuff, all right? Well, the, the vegetables, right? They're all fresh. That's but right. You're going to buy other stuff at a you was, store. What? I don't know. Maybe your wife has gone vegan and you can't have that anymore. Well, Too bad. You have to eat some that cereal. Or- <laughs> I bought some cereal like bread or wine. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No. No. That's those are different stores. I think bread might be. But we need a one stop shop, Dixon. and that's one, what we've gotten used to. One stop shop. Well, you don't. Do you get all your wine from the from the grocery store? Well, if they have it, I'd get it. Yeah, but they don't. Sometimes they. Most do. they Whole don't. Foods has wine. The one I don't. 
The one I but listen, at. if vegetables can be separate. And they can grow those local right on the roof and package them up. But then yeah. you have to shop for your own stuff too. You know. Yeah. Well, there's a, there there are things to to think about here. And and if you want to create the future in that way, sure. But I don't have those uh, visuals. I understand, but I think people have gotten used to one big store to get all their groceries. Uh, at, okay, that right? that's that that would be Jeff Bezos' point. And I think that making the vegetables locally is great. Yeah. Because it's available because all can. year round. Every two weeks, as we've learned, you get a new crop, this is right? True. For some, you do. That's true. And you reduce your costs because there's no shipping, that's et cetera. Exactly. No shipping. And, and by the way, there's no waste either because you're buying just enough for your family. And when you finish, it's there's all no gone. waste. It's all gone. That sounds like Blue Apron. It's all gone. <laughs> <laughs> you want to give a plug for Blue Apron? No, I don't. We're finished. <laughs> they're, they're done. They're, that's true. And uh, Urban Ag missed the Blue Apron. <laughs> ah, well. But, but there are many other opportunities ahead of us. So the, the point that I'm going to raise is that this is greatly reducing the need for refrigeration. Greatly. Mm. So as you buy fresh every day. Here, here's, a, here's the thing, though, Dixon. What size store will be able to sustain this? It can't be a tiny mom and pop, right? Uh, you want to go to the last you, point? You don't want to wipe them out, do you? The do mom you, and pop stores? Do you want to go to the last point? No, no, you can wait. Do I, want to wa- you. do I want to wipe anybody out? Of course not. Does technology displace people? Of course it does. So you tell me. Well, I think there will always be stores that have to have. Maybe they'll buy their vegetables from the local Whole Foods on the roof who grow them on the roof and they can ship it to or a store. Or maybe they'll start growing, buying, selling something else. Well, I don't know. You know, here in New York City, you know, the corner the, it, traditionally in New York City, you go to the vegetable stand on the corner that was owned by people from Korea, right? Every ethnic group seems to have, have its own little thing. The newsstands from people from Pakistan, the pizza yep. parlors from Italy. But the Koreans had a, at least when I lived here, the Koreans had a, a lock on the vegetable stands. Yeah. And they're typically in a storefront under an apartment building. This is true. How are they going to grow their own vegetables? <laughs> the Koreans would be very good at this because they've already made advances <laughs> in vertical farming. So in Korea. They, yeah. Yeah. So Korea would be perfect for, for empowering these people to move it to the next step. Maybe they could go up on the roof. But you didn't so, you do a study of rooftops in New York and you concluded that they could not sustain what we needed here in New York City, right? That's to feed the whole city, Vincent. This is ridiculous. You're not feeding. You can feed a neighborhood this way. So there is a group in Brooklyn mm-hmm. that's worth mentioning here as a new addition to the scene, and they're called Square Roots. Square Roots. What a great name. Square Roots. Pull them up. Let's, Square. Let's see who they are. Roots. Brooklyn. You're going to be surprised. That is a great name. I yeah, love well, it. You'll be surprised. Squareroots.com, Square Roots Grow, an urban farming and ent- entrepreneurship platform. Now, guess who the owner is? Now, entrepreneurship. Yeah. So Koreans are very now, good. What does this mean, an entrepreneurship? How that to use they, this to make business. They, they're raising money. They're actually teaching people how to grow food in shipping containers. So here's how it works. Farm to local. Right. Your local farmers are growing GMO-free, pesticide-free, real food in the heart of Brooklyn. Correct. They harvest your greens and create, curate unique selections at the freshest, most delicate varieties. A farmer hand delivers greens directly to your office. <laughs> They're the perfect <laughs> snack or healthy meal. Yeah, that's one model, but Square Roots is a training center also for people to learn For to $7 a week, you can have a single pack of fresh greens Directly delivered to you. Maybe we should get them to sponsor our show. <laughs> $7 a week, one pack. Yeah. It's called Nanobite. Right. You can go $15 a week. You get a three pack. That's called a Megabyte. Look at that. And for $35 a week, you get a seven pack, which is a terabyte. Where is that coming from? <laughs> Local, Brooklyn. Yeah, but there's another part to them that I wanted you to talk about. What was that? Because they're a training center. On how to use shipping containers to grow food in your own home. Jackson, it would be nice if we could talk to them. Wait, guess who the <laughs> CEO for the company is? Who? Kimball Musk. Is this Elon Musk's kid? No, it's his brother. Brother? It's his brother. It must be an electrifying experience. <laughs> it's too bad he's not down in the battery rather than Brooklyn. <laughs> what's, what's his first name? What Musk? Kimball. Kimball Musk. Huh? Yeah, if you type his name out, you'll get that. Uh, you'll get the part of Square Roots that uh, empowers people on how to grow these things indoors. Hmm, interesting idea. Very interesting idea. So you could have a corner grocery store, okay, 
that grows its own food on the corner. All right? And the Koreans would be very good at this because, like I said, their, their country has embraced this technology in order to, to make Korea a, a world leader in indoor growing. And I've been there several times, so I know that this is there happening he is. as we I speak. I found his picture. Great. Got a cowboy hat on. There you go. Guess where he's from? I don't know. South Africa. Both brothers are from South mm, Africa. Cool. Yeah. So wait a minute. Let's go back to this story that I was creating before I was so rudely interrupted. You were creating a story? <laughs> I was. I was taking you from the grocery store home <clears throat> so that Doris could have fresh produce every day. You could just stop off there on your way home. In fact, you could put the order in electronically ahead of time, mm. and there's a detector that detects how close you are to the store. And the closer you get to the store, the more likely it is that the order will be filled. And by the time you get to the store, it's filled. You don't even have to wait. It's timed by a GPS device that's in your car or on your person so that by the time you arrive, it'll be ready for you. Mm. All right. So who's thinking about this idea? You think I just made that up, don't you? I think I just sit no, down I'm, and I'm just sure conjure this that. into the back of my head. Yeah, you probably heard it online. <clears throat> I didn't hear it online. Where'd you hear it? No, I talked to the inventors of this idea. So the inventors of this idea are yeah. in Berlin, mm -hmm. and their name is Infarm. I-N-F-A-R-M. That's the last group I want to talk about. Infarm. Infarm. In Berlin. Right, I'm going to look that up. You do that. In the meantime, I'll tell you what they're saying is, they have a motto. Their motto is, we are the new farmers, and the city is our farm. Dixon, you must be very mad that all these people have stolen your, your ideas. No, I'm the opposite. <laughs> but you don't get paid. Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? Do you care if I get paid? <laughs> Dixon, no. I want you to be wealthy. Vince, I don't know and you maybe don't. you can fund my podcast efforts. <laughs> That's another story entirely. So, you don't want to fund my pod our I, podcast? If I had the money, I would, Vincent. You know, I would. If you were a millionaire, you would fund it? Yes. Millionaire? That's why I want you to be a, a I used rich. to be a millionaire, and then I retired. <laughs> so. Yeah, I see this in farm. Uh, where tiled their urban farming revolution? It's in German. Yeah. Well, they have an English translation also. I've, I've talked with these people. So what people is uh, in farm? Tell me about it. They're exactly what I just told you. I don't have to tell you about that. Anymore. Oh, making the, the vegetables on top of the supermarket? All of that. And they don't want to just make leafy greens. They want to make potatoes, carrots, turnips, uh, rutabaga, rhubarb? celery, rhubarb, you name uh, it. Avocado? If you, yeah, you Mango, papaya. Those are tree fruits. You use those outside. Banana. That's a, we could do that indoors. Peanuts? That's a, yeah, you could do peanuts. Why not? I'd like to do some peanuts, wouldn't you? Would you now? <laughs> you sound like Jimmy Carter. <laughs> and I want to be your president. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting idea. Well, it's not just an interesting idea anymore. It's a uh, soon-to-happen idea. Where? Berlin. I like Berlin. Now, not only is it – I do too. And, and um, So Berlin, the country of Germany, has rallied around this idea. There's a good reason for it, uh, of course. There's a guy by the name of Daniel Schuber, uh, who's a friend of mine, and he works at the German Space Agency, which is a branch of the European Space Agency. And his job – originally, was to create a sustainable food supply on another planet. <laughs> so how do another you do planet, that? Another planet. On we another can even planet. get to another planet. Wait a minute. But eventually we will. Yeah, when? So when we can... How the hell would I know? You asked me the stupidest questions. It's way questions. too expensive. You asked me the stupidest questions. It's way too expensive. How do I know? You, know you have to ask Daniel Schubert that. Well, maybe yeah, yeah, we'll okay. have to go. Okay, fine. fine. <laughs> maybe our son will start to go supernova soon and we'll have to leave. Well, that's not happening. No, no, no. But they, they, they have plans for this, okay? Mm. So the plan is if you're going to send astronauts to Mars, what are they going to eat? Well, yeah, I understand Well, we that. saw the Martian, didn't we? And what yeah. did that I guy had that well, potatoes? I asked, I asked our last guest about that, and he didn't answer the question. Forget about it. <laughs> no, I think that that's not an option. You can't eat just potatoes for three years waiting to get rescued. That's not going to work. So you have to send a more robust food generating system. Yeah, I agree. Isn't that what they're doing in uh, the deserts of the U.S.? Yeah, making yeah, of course. farms that would resemble the area on Mars. So you have to practice. You have to practice, right? So where yeah. do you practice, and how do you practice? 
Mm-hmm. That's the point. So I think we'll have colonies on the moon. Interesting. Well, we will have colonies on the moon. By the way, they've discovered a lot of water on the moon. So that's not going to be the problem of living there. The biggest problem is avoiding cosmic radiation. So you build everything underground now and you raise your food there too. Mm-hmm. So Daniel Schubert's group was charged with coming up with a viable solution to that problem of how do we supply fresh produce off the planet. Mm -hmm. And so that's how we met, because we met at one of these um, future meetings of food type of things. And and he and I really connected because he truly believes in vertical farming because he thinks that's how they have to do it. So he has engineers that work with him, many, like over 30 of them at one time. And so when you put on that many highly qualified engineering people together and you give them the metrics of what it takes to grow this food and that food and this food and that, they can make the calculations and they can design the building around those calculations. And what he ended up with, if you go online, you'll see, just type his name out, Daniel Schubert. How do you spell it? S-C-H-U-B-E-R-T, just like you would for the... For the uh, so the, we uh, have an artist, a composer, football player. Daniel <laughs> Yeah, there are a lot of people. Really? Farm? Should I type farm after? No, this is a German space agency. GSA? GR. German uh, yeah, Democratic. Not, German Space Agency? Yeah, German Space Agency, Daniel Schubert. I don't think so. I don't think he's a famous person. You think? He's not famous. German Aerospace Center. That's fine. Here we go. That's fine. He's a young man. Now go to the images and you'll see his building. You think? Therefore, I am. <laughs> he's he's here indoors Go on. with a lot of purple light and holding plants of various Oh, sort. is that what he's doing? What do you yeah. think that all means? But there's no building picture here. It could just be in a tiny Keep scrolling. cube. No buildings. Sorry. He, uh, I think he, he likes to use- uh, It's actually 110 stories that he's designed a building for. Designed, but he hasn't built it. Of course not. Yeah, oh, if he had built that, that would have been the lead story. So you're going to put a 110-story building on Mars? What are you, out of your mind? You have to design a building that you can play with first mm. and pare it down to the bare minimum before you move it off Earth Earth. Earth. So he designed okay. a building that's 110 stories tall. Got it. It's divided one-third, 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 and each third does the same thing as the other two-thirds. So there's a triple redundancy regarding the production of food because they don't want it to fail. Understood. All right. So I asked him once, how many people will that feed? And he says, I don't know. I'll get back to you. But over a 1,000, that's that's. That's a very big building, by the way. 110 stories is too big for most people. Okay, so I'm going to tell you that he's a consultant for Infarm. Okay, so you can see these ideas coming together around an idea. So the mm-hmm. idea is, yes, we need to grow food indoors. Yes, we want to live off this planet. We have to be able to do it both. And so you can do the same thing on Earth first, make sure it works, and then move it off. Got it. Okay, so that ensures... Boy, we haven't even solved our own problems, and we're moving off to another planet. Well, you can raise that as a big issue, and I would agree with you, of course. I get cynical when it comes to that stuff. Why would you want to move off when you haven't even solved the problems here? You're going to cause the same problems someplace else, and it will be just as bad, Mm. only worse, because you don't have the resources you have here. So Daniel doesn't think that way, and neither does the people at Infarm. They think that this is the solution to the problem of damaging the planet here. And they're right. I don't know. I liked your solution, which was farm indoors in multi-story buildings. Well, that is. It solves so many problems. They have, do, they have adopted you know, that. They have water, adopted fertilizer. That. Yeah, yeah, that's right. All that. I agree. It makes perfect sense. It does. I don't think you have to go to Mars to do that. No, no, no. That's not what. No, Vincent, you misunderstood. I understand what you're saying. but uh, They want to take that good idea and move it. Well, that's fine. <clears throat> but um, let me ask you a question. Sure. You, you wrote an article for your website. I did. Verticalfarm.com. It's called The Next Big Things. That's what I'm basing this presentation on. That's what you're basing this on. That's correct. In the end, you see that someday, most of the skyline of large cities will be full of vertical farms. Let me ask you, here in New York City, can you show me a vertical farm in the skyline? Not yet. Why not? Not yet. Ask them, not me. I'm not in charge of building. <laughs> will there ever be one on Manhattan or will it be in Brooklyn and Bronx and Brooklyn, Queens? Brooklyn, for sure. It'll not be Manhattan. where the warehouses are. You know, It'll be on the, either the outskirts of the city or in less populated zones of the city. 
It mm-hmm. certainly won't be in the business district of Manhattan. All you right. can forget that. That property yeah. values are much too far. So in Brooklyn, uh, there is a company that has, and we're going to go talk to them, hopefully. We are. That's right. What's the name of that company? They call it Terraform One. And they have on the rooftop of buildings some uh, they do. Ver- some farms, right? Well, they're next to a uh, Brooklyn Grange. They're next to Brooklyn Grange. Gotham Greens. Well, Gotham Greens is in Gowanus Canal. We've already t- talked about them. But we can also go What's to- Gowanus Canal? I don't know what the hell that is. You don't? Oh. What are you, in New York? You're not a New Yorker? <laughs> it's in Humboldt Street in Brooklyn. I know where it is. What, is it? what it's, is it? It's a vertical farm. Uh-huh. Like, what? well, it's, no, I'll take that all back. It's a Whole Food store with Gotham Greens where uh, with uh, Gotham Greens greenhouses on the on the roof. So Gotham Greens is a separate company. Yeah, that rents the space from Whole Foods. I'm not sure they rent it. I mean, I I think that they are they were given the airspace to build their uh, green. So why doesn't houses. Whole Food buy them and use them to supply their vegetables? As you were saying, previously? well, they buy everything Whole. They buy everything Gotham Greens produces. Is that right? They buy it mm-hmm. all. Yeah, and, and I've been there and and I've seen it operate and. They bring it down, they fill the shelves, and in an hour it's gone. Because hmm. they know where it came from. It came from that roof. I was up visiting my son. Yes. In college, upstate New York. Yeah. Uh, in uh, in last fall when we brought him, and on the way back we stopped at a roadside farm. Right. And the the owner was there. She said, "Yeah, we have several farms in the area, and everything we grow, they're terra based farms. Right. Everything we grow, we sell to Whole Foods." <laughs> That's nice. I mean, I think that's nice. I didn't ask her if she was building a an indoor farm. Ask her what she does in the winter. She says, Florida. <laughs> Look, this, do you have a fall thing where you you know, sell? And she said, no, we don't do that. We just sell everything, the yeah, whole food. Exactly. exactly. It was good stuff, though. Oh, yeah. It had very unusual. But she does all outdoor terra farming. Right. Mm, I you guess remember. upstate New York, there's still land, right? It's not the question of being land. It's this question of... Um, well, I know that in the winter you can't farm, whereas in, in an indoor farm you could. That's right. But I mean, just the whole food thing brought up the interesting point that if they had local vertical farms, it would save them a lot of money. Jeff Bezos knows all about this, and I'm sure that this is in the planning stages already. Yeah, okay. So the last um, big thing, of course, is, well, you know, so you want to make a vertical farm, do you? <laughs> So the answer is I can find a warehouse. Sure. Why can, why can I find a warehouse? Go online again and type out um, Walmart uh, warehouses out of business. I guess maybe those would be the words that I would put in there. How many Walmart stores closed last year? And I, I did that calculation, by the way, based on a, a news report that I heard. And over half of the 800 and some odd Walmart stores in the country folded their tent. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> that means there are 400 Walmart-sized stores waiting to get repurposed. So let, wait a minute, Vincent. Let's Come on. Let's you and I do this. Let's, let's develop a business plan. Let's say that we're going to raise arugula and uh, rocket and Boston bib lettuce and uh, French um, breakfast radishes. And I got a big list of this stuff, okay? It's all leafy stuff. No, no, the radish is not radish leafy stuff. okay. Come on, I can grow tomatoes. I can grow strawberries. I can grow – we can grow a lot of things indoors, okay? And you can make a lot of money this way. Well, you can make some money this way, okay? You might not get rich, but you wouldn't be poor. That's not the problem, is it? The no. Problem, what no. is the biggest problem about this industry right now? There's a problem. What is it? Qualified personnel. Did I say that quietly really? like plastics? Qualified personnel. There Why? aren't Why? enough qualified personnel to fill the jobs What that are, are out the there. qualifications that you need? Do you have to be a horticulturist? Let's talk about that. Let's say you you know business. Let's say you're a business person, okay? I know, how to, I know how to generate money. I know how to spend it. I know how to keep a ledger. Let's say I got a law degree. I'm a lawyer. I know how to write contracts and stuff like this. But, you know, neither one of us knows how to grow food. Nope. So you're Mark Ashima. I'm David Rosenberg. Who the hell are you going to go out and get to work at the farm? We want to do one of Ask these. Ask Gene Giacomelli. You could. Remember he's, what, he's training people, isn't do you, he? Do you remember what Gene said? Nope. When I asked him this very question, what did he say? I remember exactly what he said. I said, Gene, 
Over the last 10 years, of all the people that have graduated from your program, how many of them still have jobs? And he laughed. He just laughed. I thought he was laughing because he was going to say, well, none of them. No, what he ended up saying was that for every graduate we produce, there are 10 jobs waiting for them. Mm -hmm. 10. That means nine jobs go unfilled. So who's training these people besides Gene Giacomelli? Great question. That is Cornell. the great question of our time. Cornell, right? Cornell is not really in the indoor growing business. No, I'm sorry to tell you this because I know that's your alma mater, but that's not the case. Who, who is? Tell me. Well, Gene is. Yeah, I know, but besides Gene. UC Davis. <laughs> okay. Yeah, makes sense. The Wagnagen University in Holland. Holland, right. Uh, Penn State has some indoor growing technologies that they train people in. Uh, Michigan State has some indoor training. Not enough. Not, not enough. enough. Not in- that's why I said to you last year, yeah. you need to start an ag school focused on indoor farming. If I knew how to do it, I would. <laughs> or go I, to an existing school and pitch it. I can... Guess what? I don't think you want to do that, do you? Guess what? What? <laughs> Guess what's happened in the meantime? Let's talk about Gene Giacomelli. Mm-hmm. He's obviously a world leader in this. Uh, he needs to expand his operation. He really does. But to where? Where is he located? Do you remember? Is it Phoenix or Tucson? He's in Tucson. Tucson. Tucson, I call it. I know it, it was Arizona. Yeah. It's further south than Phoenix. It's a lot, yeah. It's almost on the, the, the Nogales, Mexico border, mm-hmm. by the way. Mm-hmm. I've been to his bailiwick, so I've seen his school. He's got a beautiful campus, by the way. University of Arizona campus is gorgeous. And what is their specialty, do you think? We have two specialties at University of Arizona. Space? Yes. They run telescopes. Their okay. astronomy is one of their big suits. Yeah. What's the other one? Anthropology. Really? Yeah. Hard to guess that one. They're very interested in local cultures yeah. like yeah. Hopi and the Navajo, and et cetera, but also indoor growing. Mm-hmm. So now you need more space. And so you start to look around for more space. And there is a lot of space, but there's no indoor space except one place. Walmart. <laughs> Good guess, but the wrong guess. There's a bigger space than that. I will give you a hint. What do you call the earth where all the living things are contained within it? What do you call that? Biosphere. Yes. You mean the old biosphere thingy? I thought someone was working in there. Biosphere 2? Columbia University. Oh, they sold it, though. They, they to, sold it. To whom? Don't know. Aha. Guess who got it? University of Arizona? You got it. And they're putting Gene in there, huh? They are. They're not going to lock them up, though, are they? They wouldn't dare do that. <laughs> no, no, it's not that kind of facility anymore. He's going to do indoor farming. He's going to use it as a training center. How, how many acres do we have there? Lots? Maybe we should get him back on the show to ask him, because I don't know the answer to that. But I know he's doing this in conjunction with a, a colleague of his whose name is Marat um, uh, Cassia. Cassia, Moret Cassia, that's right. Oh, interesting. So those two gentlemen are now in charge of training indoor farmers using Biosphere 2 as their setting. Do you think they could carve a little corner out and give us a production studio? I would love that. Because while you want big farms indoors, I want a f- small production <laughs> studio indoors. No, I know what happens. You get a little one, you want a bigger one. Yeah. <laughs> that's okay. We'll go to Cornwall, England. That They've got the Eden Project. That's even bigger <laughs> than Biosphere 2. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that, that Gene and Murat got that. That's they excellent. They did. They actually did. So that's one. It's a training facility. That's right. Now, that all happened in the last year now so if we had done this podcast let's say six months ago you wouldn't have learned about that okay so there's a reason for delay so you're saying why we've delayed (laughs) it for a year (laughs) no no that was my nose got longer at that point so and that's a wonderful advance because now there's a place for people to go to learn how to do this because they know there are jobs waiting for them Mm -hmm. right so, but there's something even more exciting than that, Vincent. I see, I'm looking at it. Tell something us about more it. exciting. Yeah, for so, this, you have to go outside the U.S. I have to give right? a background on this one. Go first. ahead. So, the background on this is climate change. So, rapid climate change is altering the agricultural landscape mm-hmm. in a adverse way. Okay, so where you used to be able to grow all the crops necessary to feed large populations, you can't do that anymore. So, let's just talk about two places in the world where a half of the population of the planet lives. 
China, and India. If you add up their population, so a quarter of a billion, a quarter of the population lives in China, a quarter of the population lives in India, mm-hmm. and they are both affected by the same weather system. And we call that weather, weather system the monsoons. Mm-hmm. And the monsoons pattern has been altered by climate change, believe it or not. How do we know this? Well, because we can look. It's easy. We've got Landsat photographs. We've got weather data. We've got water records. We know exactly what's happening. And over the last 20 years, if you travel to either one of those two countries and you ask farmers what their biggest problem is, they will tell you the same thing. Here's what they say. It, the rains come too soon. It rains too much, and it leaves too soon. So it comes too soon, it rains too much, it leaves too soon. Got it. What does this mean? Let me go to India first, because that is where the problem is going to really exacerbate due to hyper-urbanization. Because in both cases, in both of these countries, they are now suffering from something called hyper-urbanization. Because the farmers are fleeing the countryside and moving to the cities because there's nothing for them to do in the countryside any longer. Yeah, don't they need food? Let somebody else grow it. I can't grow it. Look at my crops just failed for the fourth time in a row. My cattle right. died. Hmm. I can't put up with this. All my family lives in Beijing. I'm Why doesn't the government help them? Well, maybe they did. Let's get to that. <laughs> but let me tell you what the ramifications are first. Yeah. Because you don't really think about this until you have to. Okay. So in India, where does all their water come from? The sky. Thank you. <laughs> and then what happens to it? It gets contaminated. No, no, no. I didn't want no. <laughs> let's let's go through this slower. <laughs> yes, of course it rains. It rains on the fields and what? it runs all the fertilizer off into the ocean. Where where else does it rain? In the mountains? Yes. And what are those mountains? In India. Himalayas? Yes. And what happens to the rain when it falls in the Himalayas? Is it snow? It freezes. Yeah, it's frozen. And it creates glaciers. Correct. And in the summer, mm-hmm. glaciers melt mm-hmm. and release their water. And the water forms the basis for the Indian rivers, mm-hmm. the Ganges and the Brahmaputra. Okay. If you go online and just type out monsoon failures in India, you will get a plethora of website stories about this. Mm-hmm. Over the last 20 to 25 years, the monsoons have been irregular at best. And wherever you have the lack of water because they end too soon, you have drought. Wherever they drop too much water, you have floods. Wherever they come too oh. soon and leave too soon, you have no groundwater left at the end of the year in order to irrigate the crops. So a monsoon failure means no monsoon and no rain. Got it. Or too much rain, too soon, and it leaves. And, it, it, and either way, it's bad. Lots of articles on that. There's a an S load of articles. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. So I've been reading a lot wow. of those articles. And you I've have? Been, Is that what you do out there? I do that out there. I look like I'm sleeping, but I'm actually reading. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I'm sleeping, but most of the time I'm reading. So And, and interviewing farmers, because so I've traveled to India many times. In fact, I was the guest at the Indian Institute for Architecture twice over the last five years, to give talks to the future architects of India as to what the future of food is raised indoors. So India has a great need for this technology to come to the rescue of hyper-urbanized cities where food is becoming more and more and more of a crucial issue. Hmm. Right? So that's, that's that country. Now let's go to China. India has an interesting political system. They have many different parties. And uh, wherever you go, you will hear the Indian um, intelligentsia referring to the traffic flows in India as organized chaos. And in fact, that's their motto is organized Mm -hmm. chaos. And no one gets hurt. The animals still seem to be okay because the cows are running all over the place, the goats Mm -hmm. and the pigs and everything else. Not too many pigs. But people, the little kids are playing in the street and, and no one's getting hurt because everybody is acutely aware of the situation and they're on hyper alert every time they drive i can't imagine autonomous vehicles in india i just think that they would absolutely be wiped out there's no way to program a car to avoid but there that. would be no uh, of none of the regular uh vehicles right how do you avoid 
you know, transporting stuff from place to place. It's incredible. I don't think it's possible. It just can't be done. It's an, it's an amazing place. It's varied. It's got lots of interesting things. I remember our first visit to India was in to, to Bangalore. And we got, my wife and I got in a cab, and we were going off to some restaurant. And the cab driver is driving along, and all of a sudden he says, I, and we look ahead of us, and of course, what do we see? We see an elephant. <laughs> the elephant is walking in the opposite direction of traffic. And the traffic is weaving in and out trying to avoid this elephant. And the driver says to us, oh, don't worry about that elephant. It's a working elephant. He's going to work. <laughs> working <elephant. laughs> a working elephant going to work all by itself. No one was with the, that's an autonomous elephant. Okay. Organized chaos. The trouble with India, and everyone admits this, even especially the people living there, is that A, <clears throat> nobody's in charge. B, everybody's in charge. You can't have a country like that. You have to have someone in charge that everybody listens to. Mm. But if everybody else thinks they're in charge, then no one listens to anyone. And so what happens is you get fragmentation of industrial initiatives. And so you have the Tata company making $2,500 cars and making a lot of money, but no one said, don't do this or do that. No one gives them a direction to go off into. So they don't go in any particular direction. They just make money. Now, let's go to the other country suffering from climate change and farming and lack of rain. Oh, oh I, I forgot to finish the story about the Himalayas. It's raining in the Himalayas now, but because the temperatures are so much warmer, it's not snowing much anymore. The glaciers are melting, but they're not being replaced. Eventually, get this one, the Brahmaputra and Ganges rivers will become temporary rivers. Temporary rivers. Right now, they're the holiest places in India. They will drain off in the spring when the rains fall, and by the end of the summer, they'll be bone dry. And there goes the water for irrigation. There goes the water for transportation. There goes the entire infrastructure of India will now be a thing of the past. Talk about chaos. That, that would be tragic to have that happen within our lifetime, by the way. Okay, the other country is China. Now, China is a monolithic country that has very little ethnic diversity. As a result, they can all be led to agree on certain principles without too much controversy. As a result, China has suffered the same thrust of hyperrealization as India, only they have a solution. And that solution is what I want to talk about. So about six years ago, I went to a meeting in Beijing called Innovating Metropolitan Agriculture. It was a meeting between the countries of Holland, or uh, the Netherlands, and China. It was a country meeting, and they invited two people from the outside. Michael Brongart, who was a co-author of a book called Cradle to Cradle, and myself. And I felt so privileged to be there. The more I look back on that meeting, the more privileged I feel, because, to be honest, as to what happened afterwards is remarkable. So at that meeting, we discussed things like sustainable behavior and, you know, permaculture and agriculture that had some basis for soil-based. I was the only person there that spoke about growing food in tall buildings. But I did. I mean, I gave an hour's talk on the advantages and disadvantages of this, right? And so what followed after that was a, a quick trip to the uh, Chinese agricultural um the Chinese Association for Agricultural Sciences, they took me to their building uh, on the outskirts of Beijing. We had lunch at one of the finest Chinese lunches I've ever had in my whole life. And I talked with some of the uh, people in charge about what it would take in order to get this technology established as a training center in China, because this is the future of farming in China. China's farming is failing uh, big time. Okay. And as proof of that, all you have to do is go to Shanghai. So you go to Shanghai. Vincent, do me a favor and just get Shanghai up on your screen as a map. There's a now pause as Vincent searches okay, I'm for there, Shanghai. dude. I'm there. Great. Now, look off the coast of Shanghai, right off the coast, mm -hmm. right? 
where the uh, the uh, large river, <laughs> the uh, Yangtze River, empties out into the ocean. Got it. I see that big island there. What is the name of that we island? We talked about Chongming. There you go. We talked about this, remember? We did. We did. Of course I drew. There's an interesting ecosystem there. That's correct. So where did Chongming Island come from? And you remember what we said? Nope. Nope. <laughs> you know how many years ago that was? Yeah, well, look, I can refresh your memory. Well, why do I remember and you don't? This is another question, of course. You probably think about it all the time. I do. I think about this one every day. So in, in Shanghai, there are some historical prints that you can get of the city. Yeah. That So in the 1700s, for instance, Kuangming Island was a little strip of sand out in the middle of the river. Okay. But today, it's an island. How big is it? Do you have any scale there that will tell you? It how? is. Yeah, I do. It's, it looks one, two, three, four, five, six. It looks about 40 to 50 miles long. There you go. And how wide? It's about 10 miles wide. Look at that. So that's the same little spit of sand that was there in the 1700s as something that you wouldn't even put a chair on and sit down and wait for the tide to come right. in. So the silt coming down the river made it, right? Correct. The entire central part of the heartland of China's farming is Kuangming Island. <laughs> it went from the farms here. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> so that's rich soil there, huh? Very, very rich soil. Yeah, they don't plant it. But... Well, they don't want to plant it. They actually want to live on it because there's enough of it now to actually hold significant populations, okay? But that's not my story. My story is that if you want to know what happened to China's farming, yeah, go to Shanghai. Show. You know, it's funny. They're showing the traffic there by red lines. That <laughs> island's got a lot of traffic on it. It does. It's got a lot of people on it already. So they wanted to build a model city there called Quan, uh, Tang, uh, Quantang, I think. No, that's not there. I'll, I'll remember the name of that town. It was a Dung. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I can't come up with it right now. But but they wanted to build a model community of about 80,000 people with uh, everything self-contained so that no pollution results from any activity. And that included the farming, and they wanted to build vertical farms on that. I've never been to China. Probably. I've been there several times. I've, in fact, I've been to Shanghai. So Probably never go. Here's my last story. Okay, this is like bringing everything up to date, right? This just happened about maybe three months ago. A news item appeared on my screen one day that said Shanghai wants to be the world's vertical farming training center. Mm -hmm. And I just jumped on this and I went all over it and I just, I just got absolutely knocked out by it. In fact, it's the, uh, uh, the iconic picture that we've put up on the blog page for the vertical farm website. But I wanted to look at that in a closer way at the Sasaki Architects, which is located in Massachusetts, by the way. It sounds like they might be in Japan or something. They're not. They're located in Massachusetts. I actually met the chief architect at a recent meeting in Brooklyn to discuss the future of this project because they're in charge of the design of it. Right. And what is it? It's 600 acres of downtown property. Now, you asked me about whether there will ever be a vertical farm in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. I said, much too expensive property. We can't afford to, to waste it like this. Shanghai doesn't think that that's a waste. Shanghai is going to devote 600 acres of land, prime real estate, not in exactly the center of Shanghai, but very close to the center of Shanghai, as a urban training center for agriculture. And the, the biggest feature of this will be a vertical farm complex. I must say, I take some credit for this. In, 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 I mean, in a very circuitous way, it doesn't sound egotistical, but about three years ago, I was invited by some developers in Shanghai to visit and to discuss with them the possibility of establishing a vertical farm as part of a, um, a future of Shanghai theme park. They actually wanted to build a theme park in the middle of Shanghai mm. to show old Shanghai current Shanghai and new Shanghai. To show you how ambitious the Chinese are with regards to their agriculture and to their architecture, all you'd have to do is go to the city hall of Shanghai and see the scaled model of the entire city. It takes up a, a floor that is the size of a football field. And you can walk around this thing and you can see all every single building in Shanghai is represented Mm. By this model, it's it's an amazing model. I, I think if you want to learn right now, just type typed up model of Shanghai City, you would get pictures of this amazing to scale 
street by street. You could take a picture of the model, take a picture of the city, and it would look exactly the same in terms of um, profile. They want to be the world leader in training urban agriculturalists. A beautiful model, by the way. <laughs> it's fabulous. It's incredible. Fabulous. Maybe you should put that up on the show notes also. Beautiful. Yeah, and I was there for half a day. I mean, we were there for half a day. My wife and I just couldn't get our eyes off it. And we went out and had a wonderful meal afterwards. You but, guys like to eat, don't you? Oh, we love to eat. Oh, And in Shanghai, you can't find food better than that. They have uh, Shanghai dumplings and all kinds of uh, wonderful things. So the point is that when I gave this talk to these developers, they were bound and determined to make this theme park, right? Mm. Well, guess what? Theme park idea fell through. Developers packed up their tent and went home, but there probably were lots of people from the city of Shanghai listening to the machinations of this group. Mm -hmm. Because the next thing you know, this idea popped up. Hmm. And there it is. And and they're going to build it. They will build this. You know, training is a good way to get into something. Fabulous. You'll become a center. Fabulous. I, th- I predict Gene Giacomelli will move there. Oh, no, no, no. They will move to Gene. <laughs> no, they will take Gene and they will export him and they he will teach them everything he knows. He'll come back. Hmm. That's what he does for a living. Actually, he's done that for several places. Why don't you do that? I don't know what you're he knows. You're not knows. a farmer. I don't know what he knows. It's true. You're not a farmer, are you? I don't know. I'm a dilettante. No, you're not a dilettante. You're an evangelist. <laughs> no, I'm not an evangelist. I'm a an advocate. Okay, I like evangelist I mean, better. I, but that, no, I think of Billy Graham when I think of him. I know. I want to change the meaning Bible, of the word. Bible Belt. Um, yeah, Steve Jobs was an advocate for Apple. Yeah, he was an evangelist for Apple, I guess. So, so the, the 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 major point that I'm trying to make with all of this is that even though we have invited many people to this show in the past who have for some reason or other, are not shown up. Some of them never called us back. Some of them got sick. Some of them got into an automobile accident and said, ask us later when we come out with our reveal. Uh, there's a bunch of reasons for people not wanting to get on the, the, a show that predicts the future of agriculture in general, by, by the way. But to know that all of this activity is going on, it's verifiable. Dixon, if we were NPR, we would have had no problem getting guests. Yeah, I Maybe. We're just a little maybe, outfit. <laughs> maybe. We don't have anybody that persists with their, come on, you've got to get on our show. Come on, you've got to get, you know, that sort of thing. We don't. Uh, we're sending out an all points bulletin right now. In case you want to get on our show, send us your CV. Let us know what you're doing. And if it's got something to do with urban agriculture or vertical farming, uh, we'll be happy to consider your application. Yeah. Okay. I have two emails. Great. You know, which is not surprising that we only have two because- <laughs> I know. If you don't publish, you can have, yeah, well. but one, they're both uh, kind of PR, but they're informative. One sure. is from Daniel, who is a student in Toronto studying strategic foresight and innovation at OCAD University. I found your podcast and have been listening carefully about vertical farming. Really great stuff and informative. Good. My colleagues and I are entering the Holt Competition 2017, where the challenge is restoring the rights and dignities of 10 million refugees by 2022. We feel that a great business opportunity is placing vertical farms in refugee camps. We've been thinking about growing foods in modular structures that may double as family shelters. Wow. Wow. We're in the very early stages of figuring out the feasibility and viability of this project. We'd love to hear your perspective on the matter, considering your expertise, your expertise, Dixon. I I understand you two must be very busy, but if your schedules permit, we'd love to talk with you. Oh, we're so busy. (laughs) (laughs) Then we have an email from Kirsten, who's a PR person for a company called Urban Organics. Oh, nice. Which is in St. Paul, Minnesota. Okay. They are building aquaponics systems inside city buildings raising fish nice. and leafy greens right in the communities where they'll be consumed. Lovely. If you think your readers would like to learn more, we'd love to put you in touch with the co-founder, Dave Hader. Oh, sure. The social entrepreneurs be- behind Urban Organics seek to do good while building an economically viable business. In their hometown, whole blocks are taken up by big, sturdy buildings that once served a purpose but have been long abandoned dragging down their surrounding neighborhoods. The team at UO took a look at Minnesota's short natural growing season and distance from wild fish stocks and wondered if those buildings could be converted. 
Using only 2% of the water needed by a conventional farm, aquaponics supports the growth of fish and vegetables without pesticides or fertilizer. Right. Their first farm was launched in a former brewery in 2014. It made quite a splash. The Guardian called it one of the most innovative urban farm projects in the world. This spring, they expanded into a much larger second location, again in an old brewery built on top of natural water sources. They're perfect for aquaponics operations. Local chefs and restaurants have given their fish and produce rave reviews and their new location will allow them to raise 275,000 pounds of fish and 475,000 pounds of produce per year. That's incredible. What kind of fish did they say? No, not, she doesn't say in this Let's article. get in touch with them and get some more information on this. This sounds intriguing. Could urban organics be the model for an urban farming revolution? Let us connect you with Dave to continue the conversation. Or if you're ever in St. Paul, we would be happy to give you a tour. The answer is yes, yes, and All yes. right, well, I'll get in touch. Good. And um, we'll Good. see if we can whip up. Even if we get on a phone for 15 minutes and talk, we can splice it into our urban. I think we have to have a new model where we don't need to get Perhaps. a person sitting down for an hour. Yeah, that's we'll right. We'll call people up. Listen. We can rec- we can call them right here on Skypey. We can do that. <laughs> Skypey? <laughs> and I can record them on their iPhone. Sure. And splice it in. We can chat. Now, let's talk to so-and-so and then go to that and then cut hey, back. Not, what do you think of that, Dixon? I love it. That's a good new model. I like So that. do you want to continue urban agriculture? Of the course podcast? I do. Of course I do. Listeners, do you want to hear? If you do, you're probably all gone, so you're not hearing anymore. <laughs> but, uh, we'll have to rebuild. <laughs> we'll try and get going here. Yeah. Uh, Dixon uh, and I, you know. The seeds were dormant, but they weren't dead. Are seeds alive? Oh, yeah. Are viruses alive? No. Well, why is the seed alive then? Because if you water it, it will develop into an organism. Oh, if we put water on a virus, nothing happens. Dies. <laughs> Where can you find urban agriculture? At urbanag.org. <laughs> Microbe.tv slash urban ag. Yeah. And there too. Or you could find it at urbanag.ws. You get redirected. Right. Western Samoa. Aha. <laughs> ever, right. been, ever been to Samoa? No. You can At send the dinner us table. I've been you know, I want Samoa. <laughs> send us your questions and comments, urban ag at microbe.tv. You can find Dixon at verticalfarm.com where he's got his latest blog post called and what's it called? Uh, the next big things, which I think should be the name of this episode. Too, yeah, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Thank you, Dixon. Thank you, Vincent. Here's to more urban ags. Absolutely. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Been listening to Urban Agriculture. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back who knows when. Who knows when is right. Do you remember what you used to say at the end? Well, I'll see you upstairs at the vertical farm. <laughs> <laughs>